based on a true story. These are the words we see at the beginning of a movie or on the first page within a book. But have you ever stopped to think about how much of an influence the real life events had on the movies you're watching or the novel you're reading? In this video, I'll be talking about a man whose legacy not only influenced one story, but three. These actions would inspire the creation of such popular films as Psycho, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and Silence of the Lambs. A man whose crimes would neatly match the horrors expressed in these iconic movies, while leaving you in disbelief that such a person could ever exist. Today, we walk you through the life of Ed Gang, the Plainfield Butcher. Ed Gain was born in La Crosse, Wisconsin on the 27th of August 1906. His mother was Augusta Gain, a staunchly religious woman with a tongue sharp enough to cut through the toughest of metals. His father, George Gain, had worked various jobs such as a tanner, a carpenter and even an insurance salesman, but was unable to hold down these jobs, likely due to the fact that George was an alcoholic. Ed also had a brother Henry Gain, who was five years his elder. Augusta despised her husband and would regularly send verbal tirades towards his direction. The boys would also receive regular verbal abuse from their mother. In 1915, George sold a local grocery store he had owned and the family relocated to Plainfield, Wisconsin. They moved to a 155 acre farm on the outskirts of the town. There, Augusta would take advantage of the remoteness of the farm in order to isolate her children from the rest of the town. The boys were only permitted to leave the farm to attend school. However, Augusta banned Ed and Henry from making friends in order to prevent any outside influence from corrupting her boys. Had they tried to befriend other children, their mother would punish them for defying her. Augusta had a particular disdain for women. She believed women were inherently evil and that they would lead the boys down a path towards the devil. Of course, Augusta saw herself as an exception to that rule. In between chores the boys would carry out on the farm, she would regularly allocate time in the afternoon to read Bible verses to them where she would focus on subjects such as murder, death and divine retribution. Henry seemed to somewhat resent his mother for her harsh, restrictive and overbearing ways. However, as time passed, Ed grew more and more attached to his mother and was more accepting of the way of life his mother had planned for him. At school, Ed was described by his peers as a shy child with strange mannerisms. He would laugh at seemingly random times where no laughter would be expected. Unsurprisingly, Ed struggled socially and was a target for bullies. Despite this, Ed performed particularly well in school, especially when it came to reading. On the 1st of April 1940, George Gain died of heart failure at age 66 as a result of his long battle with alcoholism. To cover with the living expenses George was no longer bringing into the household, Ed and Henry would take up various odd jobs around town. The locals considered the brothers to be reliable and honest members of the community. As well as working as handymen in the town, Ed would also regularly babysit for his neighbours. It was said that Ed enjoyed babysitting children, as he seemed to get on better with them compared to other adults. It was likely that Ed was better able to relate to children, as he had never really formed any social bonds outside of his own family. As time went on, Henry grew more concerned over Ed's relationship with their mother. Ed's idolisation of his mother intensified after his father's death. Henry would frequently talk ill of his mother in front of Ed. This was something that Ed didn't like. Henry would eventually meet a divorced mother of two and had planned to move in with her. Augusta naturally was against the idea, as was Ed. It's said that Henry would plead with Ed to leave the farm with him. However, Ed was far too devoted to his mother to leave her side. This was a proposition he could never agree to. On the 16th of May 1944, the Gain brothers were burning some brush on the farm. However, the fire began to grow out of control and became so fierce it drew the attention of the local firefighters. Henry had gone missing during the fire, but Ed didn't report his brother missing until the firefighters had extinguished the fire and left the property. Strangely, despite Ed being the one to report Henry missing, Ed was able to lead a search team directly to his brother's body where he would be found laying face down. Henry's body showed no signs of burns. Furthermore, it appeared that Henry had been dead for some time before he was found. It was believed Henry had died as a result of heart failure, but it was later reported by true crime writer Howard Schechter that there was bruising found on Henry's head. 
Police didn't suspect that Ed had any role in Henry's death, and a coroner would determine the death was caused by asphyxiation. This was accepted by authorities, as no autopsy had been carried out on Henry's body. Henry's passing had meant that now it was just Ed and his mother living at the farm. The death of Henry hit Augusta extremely hard, and she would suffer a stroke, paralysing her as a result. This left a devoted and loyal Ed responsible for taking care of his mother. In 1945, Gain had told of a story where he and his mother would visit a man identified only as Smith to purchase straw. Upon arriving at Smith's, Ed described his mother witnessing Smith beating a dog. A woman would then come out of the Smith home and plead with Smith to stop. However, Smith would continue to beat the dog to death. Augusta was said to be very upset by this. However, it wasn't witnessing a dog being beaten to death which was the problem. Instead, she took issue with the woman who was pleading with Smith to stop, and she told Ed that the woman was not married to Smith and that she had no business being there. Ed also said that his mother would angrily refer to the woman as Smith's harlot. Soon after the Smith visit, Augusta would suffer a second and more severe stroke, where her health would deteriorate at rapid pace. Augusta would pass away on the 29th of December 1945. Within the space of five short years, Ed would lose his father, brother, and according to Harold Schechter, he would lose his only friend and one true love, his mother. Ed was now all alone. After the death of Augusta, Ed was able to keep hold of the farm. To earn money, Ed would continue to work odd jobs in the town. Gain renovated the farmhouse. However, rather than converting the home to suit the needs of one person living there, he boarded up every room that had been used by his mother and preserved the rooms in the same condition that his mother had left them in. Ed, meanwhile, lived in a single room off of the kitchen. While the boarded up parts of the house remained pristine, the rest of the rooms became deteriorated as Gain was lax about upkeep. During this time, Ed became fascinated with stories of death cults, Nazi atrocities and cannibalism. Along with working as a handyman, Ed would also receive farm subsidies from the federal government which began in 1951. He would on occasion work for the local municipal road crew and crop threshing crews in the area. Sometime between 1946 and 1956, Ed would sell an 80 acre parcel of land that his brother Henry had owned prior to his death. On the 16th of November 1957, 58-year-old Plainfield store operator Bernice Warden was reported missing after the store had been unexpectedly left closed that day. Some residents believed that the store was closed due to deer hunting season, but one resident had witnessed the store's truck drive out from the back of the building at approximately 9.30 that morning. Deputy Sheriff Frank Warden, also the son of Bernice, entered the store at around 5pm. Upon entry, he noticed that the cash register had been opened and that bloodstains were visible on the shop's floor. When investigators arrived, Frank had told them that the last person he saw at the store was Ed Gain. A receipt for antifreeze was found at the store which had been written out by Bernice. Frank recalled that Ed had mentioned needing to come back to the store to buy antifreeze. Ed was immediately suspected of being involved in Bernice's disappearance. He was located at a West Plainfield grocery store, arrested, and the Washora County Sheriff's Department searched the Gain farm. What they were about to find would not only shock the locals of Plainfield, but would horrify Americans all over. Bernice was found shortly into the search, in a shed, decapitated and hanging upside down, dressed out, the process of removing the internal organs of hunted game, with a crossbar at her ankles and wrists tied with rope. She had been shot with a 22 caliber rifle, her body appeared to have been mutilated after she had passed. Police then began searching the Gain residence. Inside they found the rooms Ed lived in, run down, dirty, a foul stench cutting through the air. They also found the boarded up rooms, preserved in their original condition that Ed had left them in after the death of Augusta. The longer the search went on, the more disturbing the finds. It became apparent that Ed had carried out much more than just the murder of Bernice Warden. Authorities found whole human bones and fragments, a wastebasket made of human skin, human skin covering several chair seats, skulls on his bedposts, female skulls, some with the top sawn off, bowls made from human skulls, a corset made from a female torso skin from shoulders to waist, 
leggings made from human leg skin, masks made from the skin of female heads, nine volve in a shoebox, a young girl's dress, and the vulva of two females judged to have been about 15 years old, a belt made from female human nipples, four noses, a pair of lips on a window shade drawstring, a lampshade made from the skin of a human face, and fingernails from female fingers. Police later found Benice's head in a burlap sack, as well as finding her heart in a plastic bag in front of Gaines' pot-bellied stove. The findings still weren't over yet. Authorities also found a skull in a box, belonging to Mary Hogan, as well as her face, converted into a face mask inside a paper bag. Mary Hogan was a 51-year-old woman who lived in Pine Grove, Wisconsin. She worked at a tavern that Ed Gain had visited on several occasions. On the 8th of December 1954, Mary had disappeared from the tavern while she was closing up. However, police had never linked Ed to the disappearance of Mary, as they had not found her body, until now. When police interrogated Gain, initially he denied any wrongdoing, but soon began to open up to authorities, where they would fully learn the true extent of his activities. Ed told officers that between 1947 and 1952, he had made up to 40 visits to the graves of recently buried women, where he would attempt to exhume them and take them home, to tan their skins and turn them into all kinds of paraphernalia. Ed would tell police that he would be in a daze-like state when committing these acts. However, on approximately 30 of the 40 occasions he'd visit the graves, he would snap out of his days, leave the graves in good order and depart empty-handed. In total, Ed admitted to stealing from nine graves and showed authorities where to find the sites he targeted. Gain was capable of single-handedly digging up a grave in one evening. They were found as Gain described. Two of the exhumed graves were found empty. One had a crowbar in place of the body. One casket was empty. Another casket Gain had failed to open when he lost his pry bar and most of the body was gone from the third grave yet Gain had returned rings and some body parts, thus apparently corroborating Gain's confession. Gain also told authorities that soon after the death of his mother, Ed wanted to make a skin suit of his mother so that he could literally crawl into her skin. Ed would target women who he thought resembled his late mother. Rumours had spread that Ed would wear this suit and go outside, where he would be seen dancing on his farm. There's no evidence to suggest that this actually happened, however, Ed did admit to wearing the skin suit while he was inside the house. Ed also denied ever having sex with the bodies he exhumed, saying that they smell too bad. Gain admitted to killing Bernice Warden, as well as to the murder of Mary Hogan. However, regarding Mary, Gain had told police that he couldn't remember the details surrounding her death. In addition, a 16-year-old child whose parents were friends of Gain and who attended ball games and movies with him reported that Gain had kept shrunken heads in his house. Gain had described these as relics from the Philippines, sent by a cousin who had served on the islands during World War II. Upon investigation by the police, these were determined to be human facial skins, peeled from corpses and used by Gain as masks. Gain was thought to be responsible for several unsolved cases in the Wisconsin area, most notably Evelyn Hartley, who would babysit children in the La Crosse area. She would go missing on the 24th of October 1953, However, to this day, no evidence has been found which would link Gain to her disappearance. During Gain's questioning, Oshara County Sheriff Art Schley reportedly assaulted Gain by banging his head and face into a brick wall. These revelations which came to light resulted in Ed Gain's admission being deemed inadmissible. On November 21st, 1957, Gain was arraigned on one count of first-degree murder where he pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. Gain was diagnosed with schizophrenia and found mentally incompetent, therefore, he was deemed unfit to stand trial. He was sent to a maximum security facility in Wapen, Wisconsin. He was then later transferred to the Mendota State Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin. It wasn't until 1968 that Gain was determined to be fit to stand trial. On the 7th of November 1968, Ed Gain would stand trial for the murder of Bernice Warden. Despite admitting to killing Mary Hogan, he was only tried for the murder of Bernice. This was due to prohibitive costs for trying Ed for both of the killings. Arch Schley would not make it to see Ed Gain face justice for his crimes. In 1968, shortly before the trial began, Art died from heart failure, age 48. Many who knew Schley said he was traumatised by the horror of Gain's crimes, and this 
along with the fear of having to testify, especially about assaulting Gain, caused his death. One of his friends said, he was a victim of Ed Gain as surely as if he had butchered him. On the 14th of November 1968, Ed Gain was found guilty for the murder of Binnie's warden. A second trial then began to determine the sanity of Ed Gain. In this trial, Ed Gain was found to be not guilty by reason of insanity and was ordered to be committed to the Central State Hospital for the criminally insane. Ed Gain would then go on to spend the rest of his life in a mental hospital until his death on the 26th of July 1984 due to respiratory failure secondary to lung cancer. He was 77. Ed Gain was buried at Plainfield Cemetery where he rests alongside his brother Henry, his father George and his mother Augusta. Ironically, souvenir seekers would visit Ed's grave throughout the years, chipping away at pieces of Ed's grave until it was eventually stolen in 2000. The stone was recovered in June 2001, but now sits in storage at the Washara County Sheriff's Department. To some, Ed Gain was a troubled individual who had an awful upbringing, which shaped him to become the man he was. To others, he was an inspiration for their own creative works, which would then go on to influence popular culture for decades after the crimes took place. However, to the people of Plainfield, Wisconsin, he will forever be known as the Plainfield Butcher, an irremovable stain on an otherwise quaint little town. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. If you enjoyed this, please leave a like and subscribe for more content. Also, if you'd like to let me know of any stories you'd like me to cover, or if you'd like to provide any feedback for future videos, please leave a comment below. I'm looking to make one video a week, so I'd really like for you to stop by again. Until then, goodbye. For now.